إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله As you can see, every single one must have a revision note in front of him Does everyone have a copy? Alhamdulillah. You might as well get your pens out and start writing. The way we're going to, inshallah, work on this is we shall ask questions and it's a choice. If you know the answer, you raise your hand. One question will be directed at the brothers and then the other at the sisters. If you know the answer, you raise your hand. If you do not, it goes to the other group. And we shall work like that, inshallah ta'ala. That way, no one will feel pressured in any way, shape, manner. Do we understand that, inshallah? Is that easy? Because we can do it another way. By going in terms like this. <laughs> Which do you prefer? The first one. A lot of motivation and dedication, huh? MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. The questions, inshaAllah, shall be asked from any place. It does not mean we initiate on page number one. I can ask a question from page 11, then go back to page number two. So do not believe that the question will be directly the one after the one that was just asked. It is usually a strategy that is used by teachers so people do not ponder as we're asking and answering on the next question and then not hearing the previous one. Kabich? Alhamdulillah. So we start inshallah ta'ala. Page one, question number one. Question B. Why did he not say, or his parents will turn him into a Muslim? And that's referring to the hadith in question number one. Why did he not say that his parents will turn him into a Muslim? We know the hadith that says that every person is born upon the fitrah, the fitrah, and then his parents convert him. Why do we say convert and not revert? Because everyone that leaves Islam converts. Everyone that enters Islam reverts back to their origin, to their origin. So you hear many teachers and Muslims utilize the word conversion or convert to Islam. That is false. The real term to use is revert. Because everyone reverts back to the deen. But those that leave the pale of Islam have converted from Islam to a false, evil, wicked belief. Is that understood? So the parents convert that child from his essence, making him a Christian, a Jew, a Zoroastrian, and so forth. Why? Did he not say Muslim from the brothers? Nazri. Yeah, 
Uh, natural distribution means he's already a Muslim, so he cannot be turned into something he already is. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, the very essence of natural disposition is that he's already a Muslim, therefore his parents cannot turn him into something he already is. Very, very good. Absolutely correct. As Nazri said, because our essence, our origin is that we are Muslims. We were created as Muslims. We entered this world in the state of Islam. And then us, humans, parents, who on evil belief changed that individual to a kufr path. Very good. From the sister side. The Muslim scholars listed seven conditions that must be acknowledged and observed for the shahada to be accepted. Answer the following questions. What did one of the pious predecessors, our righteous forebears, liken the shahada to? Hand up if you know. Sisters, what did one of the righteous forebears, our pious predecessors, liken the Shahada to? Raise your hand if you have the answer. I can see a major silence there. Is it embarrassment? Is it shyness? No one knows. Should I refer it to the brothers? Now when we answer these questions, no one is allowed, Ya Habibi Muhammad, to look at his notes. Anyone that has their exercise books open with their notes, it is unacceptable. Because I've already told you, and that inshallah is the verdict. Now, any answers? Exactly. He likened it to the key to paradise. And he said that every key has, has ridges, has teeth. So when Wahab ibn Munabbih, the great famous scholar, was asked, Ya Wahab, is not the key to paradise? La ilaha illallah. He said, yes, but every key has teeth, has ridges. So if you come on the day of resurrection with the correct teeth, the correct ridges, what happens, Nazri? Insha'Allah, the door to Jannah. Adkhuluha bi salam. Shall I open for you? However, if you come with the wrong ridges, the wrong teeth, no matter how hard you show try, the door will not open. Just like saying that you want to open your car door of your car, that with the key to your house. Can that work? They both got ridges, they both got teeth, but they have different ridges. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, look at you guys are answering very well. You must have done a, must have done a lot of revision recently. Allahu Akbar. Very, very, very impressive. Barakallah. From the boys. Question two, D. The fifth condition is having love for the Shahada and pleasure for whatever it necessitates. What is the importance here to be stressed? What is the importance here to be stressed? We know that the fifth condition of La ilaha illallah al mahabba correct? So what is he the importance for al mahabba to be stressed? al mahabba is loving the declaration 
and having pleasure and love for all it necessitates. What is the importance here? نعم يا شباب يا شباب الإسلام يا أبطال يا جنود نعم يا علي to love Allah and his to love Allah and his messenger more than any other worldly possession okay no problem I can accept that but it's still deficient you want to continue تبارك الله the stability الله أكبر that's what I like to say um, the importance here to be stressed is uh, <laughs> okay uh, to uh, uh, to be loyal and to love everything uh, that Allah and His Messenger love, and to disassociate uh, from everything that uh, Allah and His Messenger dislike. Ahsan Allah ilayk. That is a main element which relates as an essential part of the declaration of faith, which is al wala wal bara. Another important issue which I mentioned as well is that when we do acts of worship, do we do it with frustration, with annoyance, with anger, being agitated? Why do we do it? We do it because we love Allah. We know Allah loves the prayer. So we pray with love, with comfort, with relief, with ease. We don't do it because we have to do it. Like a chua. Uh, it's an obligation, I have to do it, and I'm going to do it. No, we do it with a confrontation of love, desire, wantonness. Uh, that's how we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understand? Alhamdulillah. When you raise your hands, up in Takbir, what does this actually symbolize? Question 2E on page number 1. Question 2E. When you raise your hand saying Allahu Akbar, what does this actually symbolize? Hands up. Yes, sister. Yes. One of the main pinnacles of Islam in reality is surrendering your entire life to Allah Ta'ala. Because when you're raising your hand, uh, Muhammad, what are you doing? Dancing? What are you doing? Clowning around? No. This symbolizes a major, major part of Islam. It is the part of Islam. Submission, surrender. You're giving up your entire life to Allah. So when you say Allahu Akbar, you were actually saying, Ya Allah, you and only you are the greatest. So I give up my entire life only to you. My living, my dying, my prayer, my sacrifice, everything. Is that understood? This is what it actually symbolizes. Very good. Nazri, you're hiding behind me, aren't you? It's a very good strategy. I used to do that in school as well. But I can see from behind. Alhamdulillah. Page 8 to the brothers. Question number 28. B. What does Tawqifiyya mean? Tawqifiyya is an Arabic term, an Islamic terminology. What does it refer to? Ya ikhwati al-kiram, ya ikhwati al-a'izza. Tawqifiyya. We took this in our last, last lecture when Abdullah had a very, very crooked neck and he was absent. So, what does this term refer to? Tawqifiyya. Do you guys eat sultanas? Do you eat sultanas? They say sultanas helps your memory. 
It is a scholarly saying. The scholars used to say that sultanas helps your memory, but don't eat too much, because huh? it, it can affect your memory in the sense of disparage it. Did we have sultanas today, uh, Nazri? Raisins. Raisins. Not much difference, Shah Habib. Not much difference. Did you eat them this morning with your cornflakes? Oh, yeah, the big nasi lamak. Ah. So, what does tawqifiyya mean? Brothers, shabab, ahibba, sisters, tawqifiyya. Naam, yakhti. Yes, that is the answer. That is the answer. That all the names of Allah and attributes must be in accordance to a text. From where? A text from where? Your grandpa or your grandma? Grandma? From the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. The text must be from the Quran and the authentic Sunnah. Every name of Allah Ta'ala, every perfect attribute must be in accordance to a text from the Quran and the Sunnah. Very good. Quran and the Sunnah. Or all the Sunnah. The same thing, authentic Sunnah. Quran and Sunnah. Now you start philosophizing with Fasya Azri. Now, brothers again, what does pantheism mean? Question number 28A, page 8. Pantheism. Naam ya habibi. It means that Allah is everywhere and everything. Allahu Akbar, yes. It means that Allah Ta'ala, they believe this, a lot of Sufis, that Allah and the material world is one. Everything is Allah, they say, and Allah is everything. Who was the main founder? Huh? Ibn Arabi, ya akhi Nazri, yes. And what did he say when he was questioned about where is Allah, ya Iman? There is nothing in my book except Allah. Yes, very good, ya Habibi. He said, there is nothing under my cloak except Allah. And then he said this wicked saying, I am Allah and Allah is I. Audhu Billah. Did they give him a reward for that saying, Nazri? Yes. Uh, a reward? Yes, the sword around his neck. They rewarded him with an execution. The slicing of his neck. That was the reward he received. Very good. Is it a sister's or a brother's turn? <laughs> sister's. Question number 32. Regarding al asma' wa sifat, our righteous ancestors said, leave them alone. Who's going to complete this statement for me? Leave them alone. Naam, ya Leave them alone? Ah, is that your own explanation? See, since this is a quote, we cannot accept that. It's correct understanding. But since it's a quote, we have to quote exactly as mentioned. Anyone else? Leave them alone. How? Three, two, one. Brothers? Leave them alone. Leave what alone? Who's the they? Leave the like the the animals, the horses and the donkeys, or the cows and the lion? Which one? Leave them alone. And the completion? The completion? Astaghfirullah alazim. What's going on here? From the ladies' side and the men's side, not one of you. At least one. Even half of one. We had a half of one just now, actually. Anyone? No one's going to raise their five fingers, or four fingers and one thumb, huh? No one's going to raise. Lead. Naam, Ya Sharif, Tabarakallah, you've saved the day. Inshallah, you have, huh? What is it? And you don't ask how they are. Very close. Leave them alone as they have been reported without asking how. Leave them alone without the way they've been reported, without asking how. And what is he referring to, Ya Muhammad, here? Leave what alone? 
what? <coughs> what has been said? What has been said? What's been said? In the Quran and the Sunnah. What is he referring to here when he says, leave them alone, yeah. scholars? Yeah. Leave what alone? As they have been reported. Attribute, Allah's attributes. Yes, good man. Leave the names and the attributes alone. Do not try to be a scholar and know more than that which you have been given. We have been restricted with the names and attributes of the Almighty Allah. We are not allowed to go beyond our ability. That's why they said, do not try to start philosophizing, indulging, delving into that which was not given to you. Leave them. <laughs> Question 35. Sisters, does Allah the Almighty mention in His book that things are sent to Him and descend from Him? Please answer. Now, any answers? Does anything ascend to Allah Ta'ala? Uh -huh. You're not sure? They do, but. Yes, that's half the, question, half the answer. That's yes, referring. Very good. You've mentioned the situation of Isa ibn Maryam. In Al Ali Imran, verse 55. It called Allah, Ya Isa, inni matawafika, warafiuka ilay. Allah says, We got an Isa. O oh, Isa, I shall take you and raise you to myself. Did Isa die? He did not die. Was he crucified? Absolutely not. Ma katalu. وَمَا صَلَبُوا وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَا لَهُمْ Does anything descend from Allah Ta'ala? Open to anyone. Does anything descend from Allah? Uh -huh. Al-Barakah. Where's your proof? <laughs> I mentioned something very clear. In one of the verses, the verse is from Al-Fussilat or Surat Fussilat. Hamim Tanzilun Min Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Hamim, a revelation descending from the most gracious, most merciful. Fussilat, verse 1 and 2. Sorry, can you also say like the Quran descended from Allah? Like this is the Quran. Yes, there's many verses, Ya Abdullah. Many verses. You can say any verse, that is the correct verse. Revelation. A revelation descending from the most gracious, most merciful. Question number 40, the brothers. Mention what Abu Hanifa. What Abu Hanifa? The question is, what did Abu Hanifa say regarding the person who disbelieves in Allah's Highness above the heavens? What did Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, say regarding Allah's Highness above the heavens above his creation Tadal. the signs have been established are you trying to guess or you just no, trying? I remember that okay. I'm trying to establish uh, don't ask how 
You're mixing up with another, another beautiful scholar. That's Malik ibn Anas. Good try, Nasri. Anyone? Anyone? It's open to all. What did Abu Hanifa say? Naam, ya Habibi, tabarakallah. I like those hands when they are raised. Um, he's above the seven heavens. It's part of his answer. He said, whoever claims or says that Allah is not, or he says that he does not know whether Allah is in the heavens or on earth is a kafir. Whoever says that he does not know whether Allah is in the heavens or on earth is a kafir. Why? Because he says, Allah says in Surah Taha, verse 5, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa The ever-merciful rose upon his throne. And then he says, and his throne is above the heavens. This is his statement, Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa's name is An-Nu'manu ibn Thabit. An-Nu'manu ibn Thabit. Okay, the same question. What did Ash-Shafi'i say? Are the questions too hard? They're hard? I tried my utmost ability to make them easy. My utmost ability. <laughs> try harder next time. Well, I didn't try hard enough? Okay. Anyone know what a chef he says? I'm going to leave it open to all. You have it written down. You have it written down? Why isn't it written down in your computer? And your computer is here. Al Shafi'i says, Rahimuhullah Ta'ala, that the Sunnah that we and our companions are on, and those who follow the Hadith, that Allah Ta'ala is above His throne, above His throne. He comes close to his servants as he please and he descends to the lowest earth, the lowest earth as he pleases. This is the saying of Muhammad ibn Idris, a Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. Did we get that? And he descends to the lowest earth, or to the lowest heaven, sorry, as he pleases. To the lowest heaven as he pleases. And he descends to the lowest heaven as he pleases. What did Ahmad say? The same question. Open to all. What did Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal say? He said that Allah Ta'ala is above his throne in the way that he likes in the form that he likes. We do not describe it, nor do we define it. We do not describe it, nor do we define it. Question number 39 to the brothers. What did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receive? from his Lord during the night of ascension. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give his beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he ascended beyond the seven skies? Who knows? Yes, Muhammad. He was given three things, correct? Three things. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him uh, beyond the seven heavens, the seven skies, uh, he gave him three things. What were they? The salah. The five prayers. Good start. That's one third of the answer. We're doing very well. You want to give the credit to the others. I'll tell you what, if they don't know, I'll come back to you. Anyone else? Naam, ya astazi. The remission of serious sins as long as the believer does not commit serious Very good. 
the remission of serious sins to all the believers. When? As long as they do not associate partners to the Almighty. And number three, Na'am Ya Azizi. Very good. The concluding verses of Al Baqarah. You were saved, dear Muhammad. You were saved. Or were you not saved? Did you know the answers? Of course you did. Alhamdulillah. Question number 37. When and where did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say the following statement? While raising his finger to the sky and then pointing it at them, he said, Oh my Lord, be witness. Where did he say that? And when did he say that? Sisters. <laughs> Where? During the final sermon of? Our pilgrimage, yes, very good. Where was it? The sisters, wait till they, they don't, inshallah, get it. I will definitely come back to you. <laughs> she was a bit quick, huh? Yes, he said it on the day of Arafah. Huh? In his final sermon. Uh, in his final pilgrimage. How many pilgrimage did he have? Or did he do? Only one? You sure? You look like your eyes are a bit curious. They're all you know, confused. One. one. Stability, yes. How many Umrah? How many Umrah did he perform? Six or seven? One, one only? Four. Four. Allahu Akbar. Look at that strength. Tabarakallah. <laughs> It was definitely only four. The answer is correct. Who is Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam al-Salmi? And please explain what happened to him, the brothers. Who is Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam al-Salmi? And what was his encounter with someone? Naam ya Nazri. He was, uh, he owned some sheep. He owned some sheep and uh, one sheep went missing and then the slave girl he slapped her, felt bad and went to the Prophet some of her son, and he, it resulted in the Prophet asking her, uh, where is Allah and who am I? And she indicated to her gestures that Allah is above the heavens and he is the uh, messenger of Allah. Zadakallahu khairan. Very, very, very perfectly answered, Tabarakallah. Very nicely answered. Muawiyah was the companion, radiallahu ta'ala, who said, I had a slave girl and she used to herd sheep for me. One day I discovered that a wolf had killed one of the sheep. So he said, I am only a human being, a mortal, and I get upset like any other man gets upset. So I slapped the slave girl on the face, and then I felt bad, he said. So he went to whom? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and said, Ya Rasulullah, the situation's ABC, should I not free her as a means of atonement, expiation for his sin? Then Rasulullah sallallahu said, what? Bring her to me. When she was brought to him, he asked her two simple questions. Where is Allah? And Abdullah, what did she do? What did she say? She said nothing. She pointed with her finger that he is above the heavens. And then he asked her, who am I? What did she say? Rasulullah? No, what did she say? What did she do? She pointed to Rasul Allah. You are the messenger of Allah, in other words. So what did he say? Free her, for she is a believer. Free her, because she is a believer. Alhamdulillah. Question number 38 to the sisters. Does Allah the Almighty Descend to the lowest heaven. If yes, why? 
Who's going to answer that? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend to the lowest heaven? If yes, why? Anyone? Go for it. In the last third of the night to see He descends in the last third of the night. Every night. Uh huh. And then says, yes, who will call on me? So I may respond. And he says, you're getting there. Who will ask of me so I may give him? And number three, and the last, which is? Very good. Who will ask for my forgiveness so I may forgive him? Now the second part of the question is, a very important question. And why is it shirk to say that if the angels are the ones that descend and not Allah, why is it shirk? Brothers. Why is it shirk to say that if it is the angels that descend and not Allah, why is this statement shirk? Naam ya Nazri. Because the purpose of descending is to grant but forgive and only Allah can do that in my Very good. Basically, to say that it is the angels that say, I will forgive you, I will respond to you, uh, I will give you, it is sure. Can the angels forgive us for our sins? Absolutely not. This is a gibberish statement. Not only gibberish, it's kufr, blasphemy, and unacceptable uh, by the Almighty Allah. It is Allah that can only forgive. It is Allah that can only give. It is Allah that can only respond to our dua, not the angels. Question number 34. The brothers or sisters? Brothers. Question number 34. Mention the references for the seven verses that Allah Ta'ala established His throne. Seven verses, huh, Shaykh? Or seven or eight? Seven, huh? Seven verses that mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established his throne. Seven verses. Allahu Akbar. All of them saying, Istawa ala al arsh. Then you get some idiots saying, No, 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 no. It's not stawa, it's stola. And when you ask him, Where in the world did you get this misinterpretation? They say, Wallahi, there's a Jewish poem out there. That's what they say. A Jewish poem that says, in the Arabic it says, Stola. An absolute refutable uh, statement that has no basis whatsoever. Seven beautiful, sacred, noble, uncreated verses from the Almighty Allah, all referring to Allah, rose upon His, in a way, in a way, Shaykh Abdullah. In a way that suits his majesty, his glory, his highness. Who's going to mention the first two or three? Ya Shabab al Islam, Ya Junood Allah Ta'ala, our lovers of Haq, our students of truth, our shining beacons, our teachers of Islam. Future, insha'Allah ta'ala, lights, flashing lights for all Muslims. Naam, ya habibi. Ayat al-Kursi. Ayat al-Kursi. That we number eight. Which way about? If we say there's a one, there's a part in Ayat al-Kursi, that means if there is, it'll be eight verses. But I don't know anything in Ayat al-Kursi. Let's say he rose over his throne. Allah. 
Even if you recite it a billion times, you will not find it. Anyone? Good try anyways. Anyone? Sisters, anyone from there? Even one? One only? If you even even mention just the, the actual surah, not the number of the verse, Naam Yakti. Furqan? What verse in Furqan? Bit hard, is it? <laughs> so you utilize that, huh? Very good, Tabarakallah. Very intelligent. Al Furqan is correct. Al Furqan is verse number 59. Anyone else? That's one. We've got six left. Fussilat? That will be another addition. But the addition will be eliminated because it does not have it in it. Good try anyway. Anyone else? Naam Yahti. Taha. Number? Five. Ar Rahman wa ala al arshistawa. Naam ya razam. Ahzab? Ahzab? Bahdaltina. Anyone else? Naam ya akhti. Al-Baqara, definitely. Which surah, which number? 1-9? 29 is correct. That is number 3. Any more? Naam ya akhti. Which one? Yunus is correct. One number. 3 is absolutely correct. Tabarakallah, very good. That is number 4. Any more? we only got three left. Three up for grabs. Iman, Mikael. <laughs> Very good. That is a Ra'd. A Ra'd one and two. You're doing well. You either got the verse or you've got the Surah. Two more left. Two more left. Uh huh. Asajja, excellent. Which number? Number four. One more left. One more left. One more left. Al A'raf, Ahsanti ya Ukhti. Which verse? 54 is a hundred percent correct. You got no sheets open there, have you? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Tabarakallah. Very, very, very good effort. Tabarakallah. Very, very impressive. May Allah reward you all. So these verses are very important to learn and study. Why? So you understand exactly how to refute or teach people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, essence and being, where he is. And he's definitely on his arsh. We did not say that. Our parents did not say that. Who said that? The creator himself. He described himself being over his throne. So no one can come and say, no, 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 he's not. Are they more knowledgeable than Allah ta'ala? Absolutely not. Question number 33. Who are we up to? The boys or the girls? girls? The ladies. Mention three attributes of Allah with proof and how we should understand them. Three attributes. I want one to start off with. Just one attribute. Uh -huh. Allah has hands. Where would you get that from? Very good. Confirmation, affirmation, stability from Surah Saad. Which verse? You're getting there, you've done two thirds of the question. Verse number? Before that, it's correct, it's got two hands. But before that, which verse in Surah Saad? Verse number? Seven, five, seventy-five. Where Allah Ta'ala says, it call Ya Iblis, Ma Mana'aka and Tasjuda, Lima Khalak to be a day. 
What prevents you from prostrating to the one who I'm created from? Oh, with my? Both? No, both hands. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Another attribute from the brothers now. The sister answered it perfectly. Another attribute that we mentioned. We mentioned about five or six, I think it was. Uh, Ali, uh, Abdullah, any attributes there? Very good, Nazri. That Allah Ta'ala has a face. Where'd you get that from? That's one third of the question, of the answer. Anywhere? You forgot it. No problem, inshallah. Very good. Surat? Very good. You can utilize the a'la, yes. We mentioned something more clearer than that. Acceptable? But we mentioned a particular verse that is very clear. Huh? That's another one from Al-Baqarah. Even more clearer. Anyone of Allah's countenance? What does countenance mean? Countenance. Mikael, can you write countenance for us on the board? Countenance. What is countenance? You say we only worship Allah uh, purely, solely for His countenance. Can we say that? Yes, we can. So what does countenance mean? In the English language, countenance. You know how to write it? Nazi, you know how to write countenance? You know? Tafadal Halim. Countenance means the face. The face. Another terminology, another word for face in English. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, he has a face. Ahsanta ya nazri. Very well. There is another term or another word for face. In surah, what does Allah ta'ala tell us? He has a face that will not perish. But every other thing will perish. Surat, Surat Ar, Ar Rahman, verse 20, 28 or 29? 27, verse 27. Verse 27, Allah Ta'ala says, Ar Rahman, oh, He says, Kullu man alayha fan, wa yabqa wajhu rabbika dhul jalali wal ikram. All that is on it, on this earth, will perish. And the face of your Lord, full of honor, might and splendor, shall remain forever. Very good. Another attribute. Allah has a shin. S-H-I-N. Where did you get that from? Where did you get that from? You check now. Who knows where Shin has come from? Anyone? Sheikh Adam, Allah has a Shin, hasn't he? Definitely, yeah? He's got a Shin. <laughs> the Shin in, the, in our understanding is that which is between the ankle and the knee. Salk. Salk. So, Allah definitely has a Shin. Where in Surat Al Qalam, verse 42? Yawma yukshafu an saq, wa yud'awna ila sujudi fa la yastati'oon. The day when the shin shall be laid bare, and they'll all be summoned, all of us, to prostrate. But they will not be able. Who are they? It's mentioned in Bukhari that the shin here is definitely Allah's shin. He said, that Allah will lay bare his shin and every believer will prostrate himself before Allah man and woman but there will remain who? who will remain unable to prostrate? yes those who prayed out of showing off or to gain good reputation this ayah is a very important verse. We can derive something extremely imperative. That if you are praying today, not for the countenance of Allah, 
you will not be able to prostrate yourself before Allah on the day of judgment. The hadith clearly says that those who pray out of showing off or for showing off or out of gaining some material gain, when they try to prostrate before Allah Ta'ala, their back will become like one single vertebra, their backbones will be stagnant, strong, stable, stiff. When they prostrate, they'll fall back. They'll what? Fall back. So be very careful that when we do sujood in this life, we do it for one reason, and that is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, very, very goodly or wellly answered, mashaAllah, tabarakallah. Who are we up to? Yes. Question referring to this? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. In Bukhari, you get a Google search, and you find under the attributes of Allah. The chapter, Sifatullahi Ta'ala. Or, you go into Google, you got internet obviously, just put down the shin of Allah and you'll see inshallah many sites that will give you the exact position there's no shadow of doubt no one doubted this Abu Bakr didn't doubt this Umar, Uthman, Ali, Saifullah the red bandit warrior Abu Dijana all of them affirmed this so who are we to come today and say no he has no shin it means this or means that people like that need to be executed because they are denying Allah's attributes, denying Allah's name. How dare anyone try to explain Allah in a way that he did not explain himself. He did not describe himself. We are humans. We are limited. We are restricted in our knowledge. We accept with full acceptance what Allah has described himself with or on the tongue of Muhammad Sallam, and that's it, period. Leave them as they have been reported without relating how we don't know that philosophize, then indulge in that which you have not been given. You find that in Charlem Bukhari. The brothers. What is the correct creed of every Muslim regarding Tawheed al-Asma'i wa Sifat? Please explain in light of what you have studied. What is our methodology, our belief, our creed, our dogma, our doctrine when it comes to understanding Tawheed al-Asma'i wa Sifat? What do you reckon, Muhammad? Very simple question. Are you going to give someone else the credit, inshallah? You're such a, a person that's got so much generosity, inshallah. Anyone? Yeah. Naam, ya Nazri. Not exact wording, but that every name and attribute must be ex accepted as it was affirmed by Allah in the Quran and as affirmed by the Prophet in the Quran. Very good, that's the first part of the definition. That we must believe in every name and attribute that Allah mentioned in His glorious, sacred, noble, uncreated book and that which was affirmed by who? By Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the authentic sunnah. Now, the second part comes without what? Without what? <laughs> Any we should take off the right one we take. <laughs> Any imperfection? So Allah is perfect. Not exactly that. You're, you're on the right passage, but it's not the passage I want. <laughs> Naam Sharif. <laughs> Without tahrif. <laughs> Without ta'teel. <laughs> Without tamthil. <laughs> Without tafweed. <laughs> and Without. 
You said that already. Tamthil and Tamsil is the same thing. Without one more? Takif. Ahsan Allah ilayka ya akhil aziz. You must accept all of these without tahrif, ta'til, takif, tamthil, and tafweed. What does ta'til mean? Sisters, what does ta'til mean? Ta'til. Uh huh. You get in there? Almost there? The denial of Allah's names and attributes. Yes. What does tahrif mean? Tahrif. Anyone? Everyone? Animate or inanimate? Is there any inanimate in Nazri? Is there any inanimate amongst us? <laughs> You're a smart one, aren't you? No, I'm your Iman. Very good, Ya Iman. Distorting the names and attributes, whether in words or meaning. Ahsanta Ya Habibi. What does taqyif mean? Taqyif. Naam Ya Habibi. To describe the attributes and uh, names. Not a problem, yes. Saying how they are to try to describe them. What does tamthil mean? Tamthil, anyone? Resembling. Resembling the names and attributes. Yes, very, very good. And what does tough weed mean? Tough weed. Tough weed. Uh huh. Naam, ya Iman. Exactly, Ahsanta, ya Akhil Aziz. Saying that they have no meaning. That is what tafweed means. Very, very nicely answered. Barakallahu fikum jamiyan. Question number 20. Sisters, what does the if I only syndrome mean? What does the if I only syndrome mean? What does the if I only syndrome mean? Sisters, now I'm Yachty. I can't accept that. You got a good explanation, but it's not the explanation that I'm after. Good try. Anyone else? You're not? Again, no. Now we've moved away from Asma' or Sifat. Don't get complicated. We've moved away and entered the topic of Ibadah. This was taught in the topic of Uluhiyya, Ibadah. It's called the If I Only Syndrome. And the majority of Muslims, people live by this. Naam Ya Nasri. Yes, and what do you say when you're not Rida? Pleased? Accepting? What do you say? It's called the if I only syndrome. <laughs> Bit shaky there, huh? Anyone? No, I'm your Abdullah. No, not that one. Not if I only did this, there's something else. If I only. Remember that statement? We had a bit of a laugh behind that. If I only had a better wife. I'll be more grateful. If I only had a better husband, I'll be much more grateful. 
if I only had a better car, uh, if I only had a better house, better clothes, more money, if I only had this and that, I will be grateful. It is that we focus so much on the things we do not have instead of praising Allah uh, for the things that He has given us. It's called the if I only syndrome. Alhamdulillah. Brothers, what did, question number 16, what did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say when his son Ibrahim died? What did he do? What did he say, sorry? What did he say when Ibrahim, his son, died? Ya ahibba, ya izza, ya abtal al-islam. Ya Junood Allah, Ya Asatiza, anyone? Yeah, I'm Yami Kaid. That's what we should all say, yes. I, exe I accept that as a statement that we should all say. But did he say that? Not exactly. <clears throat> Not exactly. What did he say? Was he deeply grieved over his son's death? Yes. Did he weep? Yes. But what did he say in exact words? Naam, Yachti. I was talking about something about the tears are shed. First thing, he said the tea, the eyes shed tears. Uh -huh. The heart grieves. Very good. And? Almost. You got it? Just over two thirds. But we say nothing except that which pleases Allah. The eyes shed tears, the heart grieves, but we say only what pleases Allah. In other words, even at the time of death, whether it's your children, whether it's your relative, your cousin, your close friends, we should never ever forget who we are, why we are here. We are here as slaves of Allah. We never forget this word, this term ibadah. We are always remembering this term so we can live as true slaves with full servitude to no other than Allah Ta'ala. So even at the time of death, if your son dies or your wife or your husband or your brother or sister, or your mother and father, you do not act in a way where you refuse the decree of Allah Ta'ala. You do not act in a manner or say anything that declines or rejects or is displeased with qada wa qadr. Understand? This is why he said, but we only say that which pleases Allah Ta'ala. Very good. Very, very good. Question number one five. Brothers, are we up to you guys? Question number fifteen. Sa'ad ibn Rabia Husted Abdurrahman ibn Auf Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhuma. Please explain their encounter. Do you remember Sa'ad ibn Rabi'ah, who was the Ansari? You know it, Ali? Fadda. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, the uh, Muslims from Mecca migrated to uh, Medina, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, put the Sahaba together uh, from the Ansar and the Muhajireen. Uh, amongst the Muhajireen, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, put Abdurrahman bin Awf and uh, Sa'ad ibn uh, Abu Rabia together. Uh, at that point, uh, he wanted to show his brother, he wanted to show how much uh, brotherhood he had for uh, Abdurrahman bin Awf. He offered his wife, uh, not only uh, any wife, but the wife he loved most, and he also offered uh, half of his wealth. 
to Abdul Rahman bin Awf. Abdul Rahman bin Awf said, just point me to the marketplace. After some time, Rasulullah uh, saw Abdul Rahman bin Awf, and he was looking good, he was dressing nice, and uh, Abdul Rahman bin Awf turned out to be one of the wealthiest Sahaba. Zadakallahu khayra, zadakallahu fiqh. Very, very nicely related by our beloved brother Ali. Yes, that was the exact answer. When Sa'ad ibn Rabi' hosted Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he said, I have this much money, I give you half of the money, these are my assets, this is my property, I will equally divide it between two, this is your share, this is my share. He said, I have two wives, you can decide which one you desire. When she finishes her iddah, her prescribed retreat, then you can marry her. And Abdul Rahman, did he accept this? No, he didn't. He said, Zadakallahu khairan, point me towards the marketplace. But this is the way the Ansar were towards each other. They experienced a beautiful understanding of Iqar, which is selfless behavior. Selfless behavior. They were not greedy. They were not misers. They were not stingy. They shared their belongings. They shared what they had. They loved each other for Allah's countenance, for Allah's pleasure. And they understood the meaning that you will never have true belief until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And they lived that. They experienced that. They understood that. Why? Because they understood the meaning of Question 21 to the sisters. There is a hadith known as the hadith of the dish. Who knows it? Uh -huh. Can I say it in English? You can only say it in English. Go for it. You're getting there? Uh -huh. Who was that wife? Not a problem. Who was the main who was the main subject here? Aisha radiallahu anha. And she was jealous of uh -huh. who was she? Anyone? Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha. So what did Hafsa do? <laughs> she didn't do any. She, done the, she was the main issue. Uh -huh. What was in the dish? Water or uh, Coca Cola? <laughs> there was food. And who did she give it to? So he and his companions can eat. Uh huh. Not kick it, kick it is a bit too, too, too vicious. She pushed it. Uh, as Nazi said, kicked it last time as well. She pushed it. Why did she push it? She made it look like what? An accident. Was it an accident? Absolutely not. She was very jealous. So what did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Very good. Ahsanti ya ukhti zakallah khairan. So when she tipped the dish and it scattered all about, all the floor, he went down and gathered all the food, put it in another plate, and he said to his companions, your, your mother is jealous. Why was the word mother used? Now, that's actually an addition that we can add. It's not mentioned, but we can add this in the books. It's actually a very, very good derivative. You know, sometimes we say extra things that are in reality concrete. They are true, but not mentioned. That was not mentioned, but it's true. Uh-huh. So, why exactly did he mention mother? He said, your mother is jealous. He did not say, Aisha, or my wife. Uh, he said, your mother is jealous. Why? It's acceptable statement, but not what I'm after. No, I'm your huh? 
No, 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 no. Okay, very good. He's reminding them that she is the mother of believers that... Very good. That we should not have any negativeness in our hearts towards the mother of believers. In other words, don't have anything against Aisha in your heart for her jealous action. You know, not like those evil, evil rejecters of Rawafid, known as the Shiites, who have cursed her called her all vicious and evil names and indeed anyone that slanders Aisha with what these evil people did they are kuffar they are kuffar and Allah says this in the Quran so we are not allowed in any way to have any negativeness whatsoever in our hearts for all the mothers of believers and in general for all the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The brothers, when fearing an enemy, what should we remember? When we fear an enemy, what should we do? What is our reaction? Who do we remember? Allah Ta'ala. Okay, not a problem, Muhammad. I accept it. Where's your evidence? Was there an encounter between a particular person and another person? Is there a cave called Mount in Mount Thor? In on the way to Medina? There's a cave in Mount Thor. What happened there? <laughs> yes, you're getting there. Is this when the Prophet made his uh, move to Medina and he was Abu Bakr in the cave and uh, the Quraysh were nearly upon them and Abu Bakr was scared. He said all they have to do is look down and they'll see us and the Prophet said, what do you think about if there are three of us, the other being Allah? Ahsan Allah ilayk ya nazri. Exactly as you said. When they settled in a cave in Mount Thor on the way to Medina, a dispatchment of the Quraysh tribe circulated the cave. Abu Bakr was terrified for himself, for Muhammad sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, if one of them were to look beneath his feet, they would see us. So what did Rasulullah say? Get the armor, get the weapons, Get the B-52s ready, call for backup. What are you saying? Allah is with us. Yes. He goes, what shall make you think, Ya Abu Bakr, with a smile? With a smile. The enemy is just outside, a few steps away. He smiled to Abu Bakr and said, what shall make you think of two men? Or what shall you think of two men? The third of whom is Allah. Allah. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا The verse in at tawbah verse number 40 was revealed that Allah Ta'ala descended upon them for the strong belief, tranquility, reassurance, peace and He sent them with troops that you see not. Now, very very good tabarakallah. Page number nine. Page number nine. Actually, we've done most of the page. Sorry, page number ten. Page number ten. Question number forty four. Question number forty four. Ibn al Qayyim. Rahimuhullah Ta'ala. He said, Deeds without sincerity are like a traveler who carries something, something, something. Complete these narrations and explain what he meant. Who can complete this statement of his? Deeds without sincerity. 
is like a traveller, is like a traveller who carries what? In. Who carries in. Naam ya Abdullah. Carries in his water jug, not water, but dirt. Very good. Who carries in his water jug, not water, but dirt. And what is the meaning of this, Ya Abdullah? Ya Abdullah. Basically, um, the, 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 in a nutshell, you can say that the meaning behind it is that the dirt in the, in the water jug is like you're not sincere in, uh, in your actions or um, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh -huh. Okay, not a problem. Yeah, that's better. Basically, the meaning behind it is if you have no sincerity in your acts of worship, is it going to help you? Is it going to give you salvation, inshallah? No. It's going to be of no avail, no benefit. Exactly as a person traveling in the desert, in his jug he has dirt. When he gets thirsty, can he drink that, Ya Muhammad? No. Why not? It's dirt. It'll be worse. Because he'll be worse off and that can lead to his demise. Likewise, deeds, any acts of worship, that has no sincerity in them, that will lead to your destruction. Why? Why do deeds, acts of worship with no sincerity, lead to destruction? Why? No one knows? Ali? Because if they don't lead towards Allah, they lead to something else which begins to be shirk. Exactly. If it does not, lead to sincerity, the only exit for it is shirk. And obviously shirk is an unforgivable, noxious sin, which ends up in hellfire. Understand? Alhamdulillah. The same question, number 44, his second statement. Sisters, the real prisoner in this world is her. According to Ibn Qayyim, the real prisoner is whom? Huh? Muslims. No, I think the sister's gonna have you. I'll come to you, inshallah. <laughs> but don't say the same thing you told me. Huh? Don't say the same thing you told me. The real prisoner is whom? Those in the gulags, in the CIA ghost prisons. Huh? Who? In Guantanamo? Maybe them? Not them? The real prisoner in this world is who? Are they real prisoners? No, 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 no. He did not say that. See, it's a quote. When it comes to quotes, I only accept the correct words. Otherwise, we will be, calling a, we'll be causing oppression for this man. Saying that which he did not say, and that is oppression. And I do not want to meet him on a day of Qantara, and he says, Faiz, you oppressed me. I did not say what you said. Huh? And on the day of Al-Qantara, al oppression is darkness. Don't oppress anyone. Now, what did he say? Anyone? The real prisoner in this world is? Brothers? Jinn? No jinn as well? Anyone? The real prisoner in this world is he whose heart is imprisoned from his Lord. Is he whose heart is imprisoned from his Lord, from Allah. In other words, in his heart there is no belief in Allah Ta'ala. He is definitely what, Ya Shaykh Adam? He is destroyed. He is nothing. He's useless, he's worthless, he's gibberish, he's garbage, he's every negative connotation in the book. Anyone that does not have faith in Allah Ta'ala is no more than a rat bag. What is he? A rat bag. And then he says something else. He said the real captive in this world is whom? The one whose heart is enslaved by his own desire. 
The one whose heart is enslaved by his own desire. In other words, whatever his desire tells him, Ya Iman and Ya Mikael, he does what? He accepts it, correct? If his desire says, don't get up for Fajr, rest. What does he do? Suffer Fajr? No. What does he do instead? He rests. He rests. Why? Because the shaitan has put some big boxing gloves on, not the 8 ounce ones, but the 20 ounce. And he's boxed him and boxed him and knocked him out, so much so that he has become the punching bag for the devil. For who? So whatever the shaitan tells him, he knocks him out, he lets the devil work on him, defeat him, and his desire takes charge of his actions. Instead, what do we want to be? We want to be a hundred ounce boxing gloves and the boxing bag is who? Shaitan. The other way around. That's what we want to do. So make sure, inshallah, you know when you train for a boxing match, what do you do? You get ready. How do you get ready, Nazi? Drinking, drinking a lot of Coca-Cola? Skipping. Skipping. Punch in the bag. What is the best way to get ready for fitness and stamina when you're doing boxing? You're a sports journalist, you should know. No, not skipping. No. It's running, running and running. That is the best way to create that which is known as stamina so your lungs can breathe beautifully. And then when you've got that stamina, you can go for as many rounds as you want. So what we need to do is not run and exercise and do aerobics and cardio so we can get to become, to punch the bag. No, our stamina relies in acts of worship. Knowledge, seeking knowledge of Islam and applying it. This is our exercise to defeat that two horned, ugly, rejected beast. The two-horned liar. No, I'm not. Uh, using your simile here, yes. Um, another good way to prepare for a match is to know your enemy. Most of the time, when we're sleeping in bed, and then if we can recognize it's the shaitan, then maybe we'll get up because we'll not let him defeat us. But sometimes we just think it's ourselves, so we just let ourselves down. Like Ahsan Allah ilayk. That is a, called the rules of engagement. In every battle, there's something called what? Now the rules of engagement means to know uh, your enemy, to know your enemy. And that is a, top, a topic in its own. We need lessons to explain this. You enter us in an area where we will take forever to finish. Let us stick to what we're doing here, ya Habibi, ya Azizi. Zakallah khairan ya Ali. Malik ibn Anas. Question number 45 says, The Sunnah is like the Ark of Noah. Who will complete this narration and explain it to me? The Sunnah is like the Ark of Noah. Who's going to complete this? Who is going to complete it? Anyone? No one? MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. That's what I like when the hands are raised. Um, whoever marks on it will be saved, and whoever does not will drown. You're a champion. You're a champion and a half. We deserve a big trophy. But we can never give you that which Allah can give you, so we'll give you nothing. <laughs> the Sunnah is like the Ark of Noah, of Nuh, alayhi salam. Whoever embarks it achieves salvation, but whoever does not drowns in the abyss. And that refers to the beautiful saying of, Inshallah, we shall get to it. So what does he exactly mean by that? What's he trying to tell us? Um, if you follow my sunnah, uh, you go to Jannah. Malik sunnah, Malik ibn Anas? No, I mean uh, Muhammad sallallahu Very good, yes. And if you don't, uh, very good. He's referring to the importance of adopting, adapting, cleaning, grasping, 
with full contact cement the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and never ever abandon it. This is what he is referring to. Question 43, sisters. Complete the following narrations. A. The excellence of a learned person over a devout person is like the excellence of a learned person over a devout person is like what? Anyone? Sisters? Anyone? No? Brothers? No, I'm your Ali. Uh, so, the, the, the full moon over the stars. Excellent. The excellence of a learned person over a devout worshipper is like the excellence of or of the moon over all the other planets. What is meant by that? What is meant by that? See here you got a full moon. It's a full moon, not just a small moon, the start of the month, the full moon. Can you open that for me? You've got more strength than I have. Zadakallahu <laughs> khaira. What's this? This is the moon. What's that? Allahu alam. Some stars. Allahu alam what they are. Huh? Other planets. This is the, the reality. The learned person is so big, so strong, so immense, so powerful compared to a devout worshipper. Why is he so strong? Who can tell me? Why? Because he's just big and muscly? Is it referred to muscles here? Obesity? What is the strength here? Strength in what? In knowledge. You said that? In knowledge. Because this moon is able to distinguish between halal and haram. So when the shaitan tries to come to shaitan here, right? It attacks this one, he can defeat him usually. But when he tries to attack this one, every time he tries, boom, falls back. Too much power, too much strength, too much light, because he's got so much knowledge. And he knows that, hold on, this is haram, I cannot do it. Halal, I can do it. But the devout worshipper may not know these issues. So when the shaitan attacks him, he's not going to be able to know what is right from what is wrong. So you can see the importance of knowledge. Do you understand that now? Do you understand that, Nazim? Yes. Sometimes, yes, he's a devout worshipper. He may pray every day of, the, of his life, every night of his life, but he does not distinguish or cannot distinguish between halal and haram. The one who can really distinguish is whom? The still learned person. That's what Allah Ta'ala says in conjunction with this in Surah Al-Fatir verse 28 min ibadihi al -ulama. Indeed it is only those who have knowledge amongst his slaves that fear Allah. Knowledge. It is only those. Allah is saying this who have knowledge amongst his slaves that really fear Allah. Why? Because they know that which is wrong, they keep away that which is right or an obligation, they fulfill. The brothers, question 43, B. 
Question 43B. You guys tired? You sure? Sure. Question 43B. You know the B that stings you? Don't let us sting you in this time, this place. You sting the bee. If you answer it, you sting the bee and you destroy the bee. If you don't, he will sting you badly. So you're going to answer it? Well, I think I know. Do you think? That's doubt, suspicion. And in Islam, we don't like doubt, Ya Abdullah. But I'll give you a go. Um, except uh, the remembrance of Allah. Uh huh. That's, That's it? Uh, That's part of it. Anyone else? Sisters, anyone there? You know what Anyone there? That the dunya is cursed except three things. What are these things? Abdullah mentioned one already. Dhikrullah Ta'ala. Remembrance of Allah Ta'ala. Second, a learned person. A learned person. And the third, Sorry? A student of knowledge. So they are the three that are exempted from this la'n, from this curse. Dhikrullah, a, a learned man and a student of knowledge. Sisters, 43C. All actions are but by intention. All actions are but by intention. This hadith was collected by Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari on the authority of Al-Faruq Abu Hafs Umar ibn Khattab. He said, Innama al-a'malu bin niyat wa English, no problem. All actions are but by intention. And what's the conclusion of it? No. <laughs> Good try, but no. The person who marries? You want a second or third wife, dear Muhammad? <laughs> Looks like you're thinking about it. What is it? I think it's like the intention based on if a person migrates for the sake of... That's the end of the narration. I don't want the end of it, I want the second part of it only. Okay. All actions about by intention. Every action, everyone will save that which you intended. <laughs> No, I'm not Abdullah. Say the hadith? Just the second part of it, not all of it. Okay. Stop. Translate it. Which basically means all actions are but by intentions, and you will be given that from what you have intended. Very good, Ya Habibi. And everyone will receive that which he intended. All actions are but by intention, and everyone will receive that which he intended that which he intended. In other words, if you are praying, your intention will be judged whether it's for Allah or for someone else. You will be judged in accordance to your intention. Do you want to have a break now and continue inshallah? Or you want us to continue? Continue. You want to have a break? Cold glass of water? Huh? Nice Nescafe ice? Hmm. You don't want any of that? Go out and have some nasi gari or something? No? We'll continue? Okay. A couple more questions and we'll have a break after that, inshallah. The brothers, all of my ummah will enter paradise except 43D. All of my, all of my ummah will enter paradise except those who refuse. Okay. You're doing well. Sahaba said, who are those? Uh huh. Uh huh. You only asked me that. I asked you for the completion. Uh, You're doing good. Those who accept. Obey me. Obey me. Have accepted. Uh, have accepted those who disobey me and refuse. Very good. All of my ummah will enter paradise except those who refuse. They said, Ya Rasulullah, and who will refuse paradise? He said, those who obey me will enter paradise. 
but those who disobey me have refused. Are you all right, Nazri? Everything fine, inshallah? Want a cup of coffee? Okay, inshallah. Those who have refused are those who disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Page 11. Page 11. Question 45. The sisters, Shaykh al Islam, Rahimahullah Ta'ala said, What can my enemies do to me? Who will complete this for me? What can my enemies do to me? This narration should be memorized, implemented, with full implementation and understanding in every second of our lives. And wallahi, whoever ponders and implements this statement, he will be unbeatable. Unbeatable. Mentally, psychologically, physically, in every manner, shape or form. So what did he say? You are allowed to assist each other. I can see when you looked at me, when I looked at you, you thought I was doing something wrong. Huh? You're not doing anything wrong, child. You can assist. Sisters, anyone? I don't know the difference. I think he says, what can my enemies do to me? They put me in prison. They Very good. They give me time alone with Allah. Very good. The first part is, what can my enemies do to me? Imprisonment for me is a time to be alone with my Lord. Very good. Next. <laughs> to your comrades. Anyone wants to help? Huh? Muhammad? If they exile me, or ostracize me, or banish me, or kick me out, as you said, out of my land, it is no more than. You're doing excellent. To, to see the creations of Allah. Allahu Akbar. To see the creation of Allah. Allahu Akbar. Under, under the creation. That's oppression. He did not say that. <laughs> good try. A spiritual journey. Very good, Ya Ali. A spiritual journey. And he said one more thing. One more thing. Who can remember? Open. One more thing. Yes, she said it. And to be killed is no more than shahada. Martyrdom fi sabilillahi azza wa jal. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Don't you want to have that honorable death, inshallah? So if they kill me, they kill you. What do you think? They'll kill you, no problem. Can. They can kill us all if they want. As long as they kill us fi sabilillah. For our deen. Dina Sumayyah, the wife of Yasir. The mother of Ammar, how did she get killed? Who knows? Don't think. I'll give you something very important. No offense. Uh, when we answer questions, say, Inshallah, it's this. If it's wrong, no problem. But as a Muslim, we have full, always certainty, strength, and ability. We say it. If it's wrong, Alhamdulillah, we get fixed up. But when we think and think and think and think and think and think, you become a fault yourself. So what did she say? What happened to her? First she was stretched and then she was stabbed in the nest. Yes. So Maya, they were persecuted with the worst atrocities, were they not? She was being stretched and stretched and stretched fi sabirillah. And that infidel chief on top of her saying to her, denounce what? La ilaha illallah. And what did she do? Denounce it? No. She only got stronger and stronger. So much so she spat in his face, saying, La ilaha illallah. A spear was driven right through her midsection. Did she feed that man? That is an excellent, excellent example of courage, exemplifying great valor. Powerful, courageous woman. Subhanallah. 
and she died while saying la ilaha illallah can we imagine dying on that path would that not be the most honorable beautiful sweet death you can ever die wallahi it is so don't be scared of anyone or anything ibn taymiyyah told us a beautiful statement we just heard don't fear anyone or anything only Allah Ta'ala. <laughs> Question 46, the brothers. Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyallahu ta'ala anhu said, I seek reward for my sleep. Just what? Now. Just as I seek reward for my prayer. Ahsante, ya akhi, what's your name, Habibi? Muhammad Raza. MashaAllah Muhammad, very good, tabarakallah. I seek reward. For my sleep, just as I seek reward for my prayer. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? <clears throat> what does he mean that he seeks reward for his sleep? Inshallah, that he sleeps in the proper way, say the proper sector before sleeping. It's a form of ibadah, therefore, to give reward for it. Okay, not, not acceptable, but there was another reason for it. Acceptable, Ya Nazri. Uh huh. Um, to gain energy so you can that is what we're after his intention before he sleeps is to gain strength energy huh? the ability to wake up after that sleep and pray to Hajjud so he slept in order to gain strength he ate in order to gain strength he drank in order to gain strength in worshipping Allah you can see the way the companions were their entire life was to worship Allah. They did not know something called outside worship. They did not limit worship to the five prayers or the month of Ramadan or Al Hajj. No. Everything they did was considered worship to them. And their intentions, Inna al A'malu, Binniyat, all actions about by intention. They intended and they made sure that everything they did was an act of worship. We will have a break now, inshallah ta'ala, and we will resume for another half an hour, approximately five o'clock, inshallah ta'ala. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. We shall, inshallah, initiate the second part of this Q&A and we start with question number 47, page number 11. Question number 47, page number 11. To the brothers, the question is, 47, number C. Explain how the following destroy Tawheed. I repeat, explain how the following examples destroy Tawheed. C says, and part of your knowledge is the knowledge of the tablet and the pen. This group of people are referring to Muhammad. They're saying that part of Muhammad's knowledge is the tablet and the pen. In other words, they're saying that he knows the knowledge of that which is in the preserved tablet. The question is, how does this example destroy Tawheed? Do you understand the question? They're saying, Ya Rasulullah, part of your ilm, your knowledge, is that you know what is in the law al mahfuz the tablet, the preserved tablet. How does this destroy Tawheed? Now, Habibi. Only Allah has the knowledge in Ya Muhammad. Allahu Akbar. Very, very good. They are actually saying that he knows the knowledge of the unseen. And we know that the definition of Tawheed al rububiyyah is that only Allah knows Ilmul Ghayb. Correct? So if you say that Muhammad knows what is in the preserved tablet, 
we are actually attributing to him the knowledge of the unseen and there is no rival equal to Allah in this area. Do we understand this? Huh? You sure? Everyone understood what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah. Sisters, 47b and who else there besides you who I can call out at times of distress and problems again they are referring to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in other words they are yielding their arms to who? to the Prophet saying that who is out there besides you that I can call out I can call on how does this destroy Tawheed? Sisters, how does this destroy Tawheed? Now I'm asking. There? How? Correct. You're correct there. They're definitely describing partners. How? In which category of Tawheed? What have they destroyed by saying that they are allowed to call on Muhammad وسلم, and not Allah? Or calling him besides Allah, with Allah? Uh -huh. Brothers, when someone calls out, Ya Rasulullah, uh, I give me children, give me provision, give me sustenance, give me this. How does this cause shirk? Now I'm uh, In all three, actually, uh, if, you, if you look at it, it'll actually uh, nullify your uh, your Islam because number one. You're calling out to someone who is not perfect in hearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sami'u al-ali. So he hears all. Number one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi doesn't hear everything. And he can't hear all the dua. Number two, um, you are... Um, you are... Um, Basically what you said is correct. You are in essence calling to other than Allah and the main facet here which destroys Tawheed is Shirk in al uluhiyyah Because the essence of Islam in reality is Dua To direct, to dedicate your Dua, your prayers, your supplications, your invocations to Allah Not to human beings Muhammad is a prophet, is a man He's a human. He cannot answer your prayers. So when you direct your dua to him, asking him of things that only Allah is able to give you, to provide for you, this is shirk in Tawheed al uluhiyyah in essence. Now I'm after. This is not a verse. This is lyrics from Sufi lyrics. This is mystic Sufism in essence. You find that not that I advise you to go and look in their books. You find lyrics after lyrics of shirk and kufr. Now, when I read this, it's not even association partner just denying Allah because they're saying there's only you I can call on. Exactly. Uh, but in reality, uh, you got a good point there. But in reality, what we're referring to is the dua. Is your dua. And the dua in reality. It revolves around everything that is worship. So we understand that. Is there an issue then? No issue? Okay, alhamdulillah. Page 12D, page 12D to the brothers. Belief in charms for protection from or removal of harm or affliction. To believe in charms, or talismans, or seashells, or any other charm, that this charm, whether on yourself, whether hung on the wall, whether underneath your pillow, whether in your homes, placing these charms, 
having these chants with the intention, with the belief that this will bring me benefit or protect me from evil, what does this destroy? Who are we have, sisters or brothers? Anyone? No. It destroys Al Rubiya. Very good. Why? Why? Because in Allah's hand and only Allah's hand is fortune and misfortune. When you see that this charm I am wearing, I am placing, I am having, can protect me from evil uh, or bring me benefit, you have made that object an object of worship. An object of worship. Again, Tawheed al-Rububiyya implies that in Allah's hands alone is the control, the governing of all that exists. He alone has the ability to cause fortune and misfortune. No one else. Not a leaf that falls from the tree or a drop of water from the heavens except by Allah's permission. Understand this. Except by Allah's permission. So how in the world will this created inanimate object be able to bring benefit? And what of evil? Does this make sense? So those people who put in their compound houses, those charms on the doors, or in their rooms, or underneath their pillows and so forth, to avoid evil spirits, or to bring protection, this in essence is the destruction of Tawheed al rububiyya Do we understand? Alhamdulillah. E, visiting soothsayers, or fortune tellers, or diviners, or astrologers, or magicians, and all other impostors like these people. Is this allowed? If you visit a soothsayer, or a fortune teller, what do you destroy? Huh? If you visit and you believe that this fortune teller can foretell your future or can tell you the unseen what have you destroyed by doing this and why brothers shabab al-islam junood allah ta'ala ahibba a'izzad sisters jinn anyone You all got the answer, I know you got it, but you're scared to say it, true? Alhamdulillah. Grab that fear with your hand and chuck it out. Ostracize it from your body. Anyone? What does a foreteller do? A fortune teller. He tells the so-called future. Is this allowed? Why not? Why? Because no one knows the knowledge of the unseen except the creator of the unseen. And again, it destroys Tawheed ar Why? Tawheed ar implies, contains that only Allah and Him alone knows the unseen. Is that understood? Alhamdulillah. Can, can, can you destroy it? Um, that's not the as well. Absolutely. But primarily, we look at the that which is more predominant. Page 3. Question B. Sorry, question 3B. Page 3. Question 3B. Sisters, what does la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi mean? What does. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. Yes, there is no might, no power except that which is with Allah. 
No might, no power, except that which is with Allah. And this is the essence, the core, the foundation, the pinnacle, the bedrock of Tawheed al rububiyyah Question three again. A, the brothers, what does Hasbunallahu wa ni'man waqil mean? Hasbunallahu wa ni'man waqil. Ya shabab al-Islam. Ya ikhwat al-kiram. Ya ulama. Ya mashayikh. Ya asatiza. There's no more words I can say to you. I've said them all. I'm trying to encourage them. What does Hasbun Allah wa Ni'mati al Sharif? Allah is sufficient to give the text to self like this. Very nice, I'll accept it. 95%. Zakallah khair. Allah is sufficient for me and He is the best of gods. And He is the best of gods. Allah is sufficient for me. And he is the best of God. A question on the side. Who can give me one example from a beautiful prophet who was known as Khalid al-Rahman where he utilized this beautiful, beautiful statement? Naam ya Abdullah. Ibrahim alayhi salam. When did he say it? Ahsanta ya Habib. When Ibrahim alayhi salam was placed on the cattle pot. You know what the cattle pot is? Huh? You know, like a sting shot, but for human beings. Huh? He was placed on the cattle pot, and when he was flung, and he was driven through the air, who came just before he hit the fire? Who came and gave him some company? Who was it? Jibril alayhi salam. And what did Jibril say to him? You want a cup of coffee or a cup of drink? <laughs> He's about to hit the fire, you see. Or you want some migarin or nasi garin before your, it could be your last meal. What did he say? Migarin? <laughs> He's a noodle lover, is he? He said to him, Ya Ibrahim, do you want my help? Listen carefully, subhanAllah. He said, Ya Ibrahim, do you want me to help you? What did this man of faith and taqwa say? Give me one of your wings from amongst your 600 wings. What did he say? No, before that. It's a quote, I can't accept it. I respect it, but reject it. Anyone else? What did he say? That's it, Ya Ali. He said, if you want to give me your help, no. But if it's from Allah, yes. And then he said, Can you imagine the power of taqwa in this scenario? In Allah, he's about to hit a fierce fire, burning, burning for days. Just about to hit it. And Jibril comes to him and says, how can I help you? They could have easily placed him on his wing and flew him away. He said, no, from you I don't want your help. But from Allah, hasbun Allah. Allah is sufficient for me and He alone is the best of gods. Allah. And what did Allah make him Muhammad the fire after that statement? Extra hot? He made it cold. Only cold? Only cold? Kuni what? Baradan wa? Salaman ala Ibrahim. Who can tell me why these two words were met together? Wallahi, anyone that understands that, understands very well. He said, Baradan wa Salaman. Not only cold. And why Salaman is well? You want to have a go, Yani? Or give it to your associate. Because uh, extra cold could be a punishment as well. Yes! That is the exact answer. If he had only said, as the scholars of, of translation said, or explanation said, 
if he only said barada, that may have detrimented his health or even freeze Ibrahim. So he said Bardan wa salaman and peace for on him. Did we get that? Did we understand this? So what did he say peace for as well? What was the reason? Why did he say Bardan wa salaman and peace as well? Because? So we didn't get it. You got it? So what did we get? See. Yes, so it can be safe with tranquility and peace and comfort and relief on Ibrahim So whenever you fall into a difficulty, don't forget Allah. You can never fall into a difficulty like Ibrahim, ever. And look at the power of Iman in that man. Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us just a bit of his faith so we can inshallah pass in this life and the next. Page number four. Question number five. A. Question number five. A. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقَ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ إِنَّ اللَّهُ وَالرَّزَاقُ ذُو الْقُوَّةِ الْمَتِينَ Sisters, which verse and surah is this? From Khaya Allah, Aha Sahran, Shabbat Hilwa. Sisters, was it in Surah Al Baqarah, Awa Nisa, Awa Al Araf, from the Quran? It could be in Surah Al Sajda. Which Surah? Verse number one or two or three? Could be verse number 100 even. If the sisters don't get the child of that, I'll come to you, Habibi Nazri, and then to Mikail. Which surah is it? It's a surah. Leave the verses out. Hayya Allah Shabab. Surah? Nazri? Surah al Dariyat verses. Surah al Dariyat verses? 56, 7 and 8. Ahsanta ya Habibi. Did you say it? Did you know that, Mikhail? Same ones? Very good. The brothers translate its meaning into English. Who's going to translate? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ This part. Mikael. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Translation. <coughs> All the interpretation of its meaning, because we cannot translate. It's impossible to translate. So I correct myself. What is the interpretation of the meaning of this first part of the verse? Very good. And I did not create the jinn in mankind except that they worship me. Second part. Ma uridu min hum min rizqin. Who knows that? Sisters? If sisters don't know, we'll come back to the brothers. No one from the sister side? No one? Brothers, Mikael, Ma uridu min hum min risk. Uh huh. Uh huh. I will stop you there, huh? Because in the in the Quran, we are not allowed to make any flaws, mistakes when it comes to the meanings. There is a bit of issue or problems with that translation. Acceptable in some parts, not in the other. Will I have another go? مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْق I seek no provisions from them. وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ Who knows that one? Rahma. No do I want, very good, that they feed me. And then it says, Inna Allah huwa razzaq. Anyone? Inna Allah huwa razzaq. Anyone? Indeed, Allah is the all provider. Dhul quwwatil mateen. 
The owner of strength are the most strong. The owner of strength, the most strong. Alhamdulillah. See, in the light of what we studied, we mentioned five derivatives. Five derivatives, did we not? Who can tell me one derivative from the sister side? Mention one derivative. Only one. Yes, the wisdom behind the creation of man and jinn, which is? Worship Allah. Number two from the brothers. Muhammad? The confirmation, yes, of the existence of jinn. From the sisters, number three. Number three, sisters. So one was the wisdom behind the existence of jinn and man, which is to worship Allah. Number two is the confirmation of the existence of jinn. Number three, Rahma. Yes, very good, young lady. It is the complete independence of Allah from His creation. The complete independence of Allah from His creation. Number four. Anyone? Anyone? Open. Allah did not need His sustenance, it's man who needs That's in the third one, complete independence. There's two more. Easy ones. Naram Yaqub. That what? That Allah is the inviter. Is the what? <laughs> the inviter. The provider. <laughs> Good try. That's the name of Allah Ta'ala, in other words, the Allah Ta'ala is the cherisher, the provider, the sustainer. If that's what you meant, it's kept, correct. There is two of Allah's beautiful names, al razzaq and al mateen What's al razzaq mean? Amen. The provider, the sustainer, the cherisher. al mateen Very easy word to remember. Very good. The omnipotent. The what? The omnipotent. What does that mean? Sharif. What does omnipotence mean? What's strong? The what? The mighty. Not a problem, I accept it. It means that Allah's power is perfect and unconquerable. Unconquerable. Another term for it is that it denotes extreme power and that all stability and strength is organized by Allah. All stability and strength is organized by Allah. Page 5, number 6. Page 5, number 6. What does the word ibadah imply? Brothers, what does the word ibadah imply? Sisters? Anyone? What does the word ibadah imply? It's open. We don't want to close it yet. This mighty, magnificent word that we live with and by and for. We have to know what it means. So what is ibadah? What is recognition? What would you say? Someone comes to you, a non-Muslim and says, what does ibadah mean? I want to know exactly what illa ya'udun means. You know, we cite this verse day after day, day after day, illa ya'udun. And he comes to you and says, how long? I'm fascinated. I'm flabbergasted by this beautiful word. What does it mean, my beloved brother in Islam, they say? And it's a Muslim Catholic. And it's worship from your limbs, it shows from your limbs, and it's correct near 
according to Sunnah of Prophet Acceptable, but not fully. I'll give you about 5 out of 10. No offense, sir. We're here to learn. So what is ibadah? Muhammad? Again, not fully as I defined it, or as the scholars defined it. Anyone else? Ibadah is a comprehensive term that has a very broad meaning in Islam that means or includes all words and deeds that Allah loves and is pleased with, both inwardly and outwardly, apparent and hidden, implicit and explicit, internal and external. This is Ibadah. Do we not take this? Alhamdulillah. Do we not forget this? Yes, Alhamdulillah. Why? Allahu A'lam, Alhamdulillah. Should we have forgotten it? No, Alhamdulillah. Why? Because we live by it and for it. Who can give me an example of in ward ab ibadah? In ward ibadah. See, we know the definition or the explanation of the word. But do we really know what it means? What is an example of inward, implicit, internal ibadah? Who knows? Abdullah? Patience. Yes, acceptable. Patience. Like like you acceptable. Is that need for explanation? Outward ibadah. Outward ibadah. Muhammad? <laughs> Not really. That could be more or less implicit. Outward. Charity. Yes, it's giving. It's action. Acceptable. Implicit ibadah. Implicit. Implicit, internal, inwardly is all the same. It's different terminologies. Outward, external, explicit, again is all the same. Nazri, give me an example of outward ibadah. Salah. Salah is a very good example. It's action. Your prayers. Ali, inward. Do you guys think about outward and inward as well? You might be asked. Contemplation. Contemplation of? Yes. That's ibadah. That's ibadah. Reflect upon the creation, but do not reflect upon the creator. It's a hadith. Very good. Outward, sisters. Present. Give and take, yes. Give and take, yes. It actually includes two. Because no one knows in reality if you're fasting or not. Except Allah Ta'ala. So that can include the inside as well. Sister. Performing Hajj. Very good. It's an outward ibadah. Internal ibadah. From the brothers. Internal. He was trying to understand perfectly what this word means. What was that, sorry? That is correct. That is correct. That was mentioned already. Correct, but. That's a correct example of inward ibadah. Anyone else? Outward, inward, I'll give you. What is fear? Put your hand if you know. Fear is what? Hand up. Hand up. Inward. What is hope? What is dhikr? Dhikr. No. Dhikr is outward. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. It's outward. It's exposed to the people. Inward means that which is hidden. No one can see but Allah Ta'ala. But outward is when people can see. What is uh, trust? Inward. Do we understand that? Alhamdulillah. I don't know about you guys, but we should really pray now. But we haven't finished yet, and there's still a lot of questions. 
And I think these questions are very, very imperative that we really analyze and understand because we're really only about halfway there. Let us pray. Do you want another 15, 20 minute session after prayer? Or are you all just finished? Can't wait to get to your kitchens. Huh? So who is for and who is against? Who wants to remain after prayer for about 15, 20 minutes? Hands up if you do. I can see the dedicated ones, huh? Now put your hand up if you don't want to stay. So there's someone's in limbo. Huh? They're unsure of themselves. Not a problem, inshallah. We'll continue the questions at the end of each lesson, inshallah, that we uh, conduct. We have about 20 minutes for left for questions only. And we'll leave it at that. Bismillah ta'ala. Barakallah fikum jami'an. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.